call me old man waves. Damn you, old man! Wade. And welcome to the Old Man Wade Show. I am your host, the God of Stubborn, the Lord of Laughter, the Sire of Sarcasm, Old Man Wade. And I'm back with a returning guest. Uh, state your name. Uh, my name is Steve Van Sampson. I'm a guy, and I write stuff like books and, and now comic books. Yeah, we have another little special guest in the room. You say hi? And I'm Derek Wick, <laughs> and I draw stuff and uh, publish stuff and befriend people who write stuff. The Wick Master General. <laughs> Yep, that would be me. Uh, we also, I've also been told you're called Conan as well. Uh, yeah, I guess we're we're gaining some names along the way. Um, I guess you've already met Ming. Ming? Yeah, Ming the Merciless. The nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Ming the Merciless. Death to Ming. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> So tell everybody. Hey, Mark, um, before we get started, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to ask you on your your Skype profile picture. Is that what I think it is? Yes, that's America's ass. That's America's ass. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> We're in good company. Just, just to get that out of the way. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's that's America. But that's with the um, old man Wade logo in the in the corner, right next to the right next to the left yeah. butt cheek. Oh, <laughs> that is America's ass. <laughs> oh man, it's Language. funny. What, when I was on the Skype meeting for the first time, they're like, is that America's ass? I'm like, that's, that, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Who's, who else's ass would that be? I mean, come on. Yes. Well, if I... If I you think that's Canada's ass? That is not Canada's ass. Well, with that being that's said, if I could find a good one of Deadpool, it would be Deadpool's ass. Mm. Well, I mean, Tom Holland is really the one you want you want a butt shot of. I mean, let's, yeah, let's, he, let's he, be real. I mean, he's got cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. He's, he's got a nice there, yeah. <laughs> 15 seconds in and we've already devolved into man ass <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair though Mr. Rook I believe you brought us here it was an innocent I, question but I, I just the picture was small I didn't know <laughs> I I was curious I, I asked the question and boy did I get the answer so Rough House Publishing <laughs> not America's <laughs> ass <laughs> so yeah so t- uh, start about, talk about Rough House Publishing how did it start how did it come to be well, I used to be a publisher once before, back in the day. Um, I got into it, uh, I broke into comics back in the late 90s. Uh, I would go to conventions and I'd just show off my work to anybody who would look. Um, and uh, I started just publishing, uh, I'm sorry, I started drawing for other companies. And the deal was, they didn't have any money, so the deal was, uh, I would draw it, they would publish it. I thought that was a pretty good idea at the time. and uh, And... Through that whole process, I um, met some folks, and long story really, really short, uh, I ended up uh, publishing my own books around 2000, 2001. And me and uh, my old partner at the time, we did a Phantasm comic book, a licensed Phantasm comic book, a licensed Halloween uh, kind of comic book slash souvenir magazine for one of their conventions. Um, we did a uh, first issue of Gates of Hell. Uh, that's now with Ebon Press. So uh, we have we did our, our little thing. We were kind of gaining our footing during that time, kind of figuring it out. Uh, just a couple guys didn't know what they were doing at all, but we knew that we wanted to publish our own stuff. And, and the reason that we got into it in the first place was because we didn't feel like we were being treated fairly in the marketplace as respective writers and artists. And that's something that's kind of followed us through the career and uh i took a a sabbatical for maybe about eight years i didn't do anything involving comics or art at all pretty much i just kind of went into the corporate world and became a uh an account manager for a long time and then i decided i wanted to get back into it and when i did i was taking commission work and realized that the um the industry really hadn't changed all that much as far as you know Comics are a very artist-driven business, and artists seem to be the ones that, that take um, short thrift all the time. Just so I know, um, is your podcast like a PG kind of thing, or is it no. hard? hard <laughs> no. You can curse. 
All right, cool, because I, I just wanted to make sure. But, uh, you know, most of the time they just had a suck and high and titty, and uh, it was just horrible, you know. And I see a lot of artists to this day uh, that just get take advantage of constantly. So I started Rough House early on as a way for me to, to kind of do my own thing, publish on my own terms, do create our own stuff. And me and my partner, Mike Wason, uh, who started the company with me and my uh, ex-girlfriend, but uh, girlfriend at the time, Sarah Michelle, uh, we kind of embarked on this, uh, this quest to, to publish quality comics uh, under our own terms, uh, away from the system <coughs> and away from anybody who could potentially um, do negative things to our, our IP. So to speak, and uh, that kind of snowballed into a bunch of other things. We we ended up meeting some of our comic book heroes, and uh, we started taking on comic book licenses of old horror comics from the '80s that were kind of defunct. And the first book that we did was from Ralph Griffith and Stuart Kerr. They had a book called The Dead. Um, these guys were the originators of the comic book Dead World. For those who don't know. And it was kind of like The Walking Dead of my generation. And uh, it was an amazing book. It lasted about 30 years uh, off and on. And uh, they sold the rights off a long time ago. And then they did another zombie book called The Dead. And we wanted to publish that because nobody ever saw it before. So it was about 300 pages long, a little bit shy of 300 pages. It was like 296, give or take. And uh, it was just massive. So right off the bat, it was this giant undertaking. Uh, we started off as a Kickstarter company. Uh, so all of our books were crowdfunded, and uh, we did that for uh, The Dead Omnibus, which was our first book, and uh, then we teamed up with Tom Schoolin, who is the writer, I'm sorry, the creator and uh, owner of Fantico Enterprises and Gore Shriek. Uh, Gore Shriek was a horror anthology of the mid-80s that, uh, again, was part of that whole black and white comic book movement that came out of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and uh, they published some really... Uh, pulpy, um, like splatterpunk style horror comics. And it was anthology things and it was just really, really great. But what we wanted to do with that was not reprint old issues, but actually uh, on the 30th anniversary of the title being uh, published, we wanted to expand the legacy. Uh, and from that came a, a book called Gore Shriek Resurrectus, which is what we're working on right now which for right now is a limited series that we're working on. It's going to last about six issues. We want to keep each issue really, really special. And uh, we're creating all new Gore Shriek stories, and we're, we're pretty much putting it out there to an unsuspecting public. For the people that know about Gore Shriek, this is like a giant return to form. Uh, this was a big comic back in the, the Fangoria age, like back when Fangoria was in its uh, heyday. So we refer to this as the, the Fangoria Age version of the title, uh, which very much, uh, as people remember it, it, it has the same look, it has the same feel. Uh, the stories are very much in keeping with what had come before, uh, with putting our own spin on everything. And we're just putting it out there and letting people that don't know about it know that it exists. And uh, people have been really, really taking to it. They've been really digging up the stuff. It's been cool. So let's. Um, I have some questions about creating the website, but let's get into the, the book first. Gore Shriek. Sure. So Steve was nice enough to bring it, so I could uh, actually give me a copy. I actually uh, took a took a nice long read with it, and this is it was really good. And so the first thing I noticed was the um, artwork on the on the cover, and then yeah. the next thing I did was I looked at the back, and I was like, oh my gosh, this looks just like something you would see like on like a '80s poster, like you know, like, <clears throat> and then like reading the the. Uh, the actual stories, like, it came, it almost seemed like it came from the deep, and it was like, it came from the sink, and I was like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, it's funny that you mentioned that, because, like, if you remember, like, the 2000s to, like, the 2010s, that was all, like, a celebration of, like, the 70s grindhouse-ish, uh, pulpy uh, B-movies of that era and everything else. Everything had, like, a, a sheen of grit on it and everything else to kind of emulate that whole thing coming out of like Grindhouse, the movie Grindhouse and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but now, now that we're in the, you know, the 2018s, 
we're really embracing the 80s again and that's where we've gotten stranger things and all these other movies that have come out that uh come out of that summer of 84 um the movie super 8 that nobody seems to remember anymore um I remember. but uh, it was yeah. I mean, it was it was the best all right. Part of that movie is the closing credits, uh, the, the the home movie that they finally released at the end of the yeah. closing credits. But um, <clears throat> and so we're embracing '80s fully now. And uh, I just and it's it's funny how at the same time anthologies in general, but specifically horror anthologies in TV and movies are starting to come back again. Yeah. And um, it's just a perfect time for this to. It's just kind of a happy accident that it's happening now, but uh, it's really a great time for, for the 80s to come back, and it's a really great time for anthologies to come back, and we're smack dab in the middle of it. Yeah, because I mean, we have, you know, I think I think probably Black Mirror is what really started the whole, like, resurgence in, um, in anthology love, you know, for the mainstream. This for was, sure, you know, everybody talks about that show now. Yeah, I mean, and this was, uh, this was for an audience that wasn't necessarily gonna remember the stuff that came before. It wasn't really about that. They're like, no, this is super ultra modern, but we're gonna tell it in the way that you know the Twilight Zone worked basically in the in the fifties. Sure. Um, so and Black Zone came back too. Jordan Peele. Yeah, Twilight yeah. Zone, and then uh, we have Creep Show coming up. Nice. Creep Show's coming up too. <clears throat> they talked show. about doing um for a little while. They talked about redoing uh, Tales from the Crypt. I don't know if that's actually still happening, but I know that was something that was supposed to be in the process. I wonder if it's. Uh, an idea if people don't really have long attention span they like the idea of just jumping into things and when you have these anthologies and like these shows like that you don't really necessarily need to watch it from the beginning like with Black Mirror there are some things that connect everything together but realistically you could start season 3 episode sure. 4 and yep. you'd be perfectly fine with yep that. right and that's like well, the, you- yeah the, I mean the Twilight Zone Twilight Zone had 5 seasons you know I don't know how many episodes but you know gotta be a couple hundred episodes or so I mean it doesn't matter what order you watch them in. No. And even <clears> now, it's like, and I've noticed things like that. Like, I started watching um, The Twilight Zone in, um, I'm mad at the first, I typed in Twilight and the first thing that came up with Twilight, not The Twilight Zone. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the first I feel time. I like we've all The Twilight Zone to allow a movie like Twilight to even happen in the first place. <laughs> it seems like we're going to wake up from a bad dream. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. But no, so like, I, I um, no, but you know what's great about Twilight? That we could have a post-Twilight uh, era where everybody just makes fun of it, which is where we are now, and we wouldn't have that if we didn't have the pre-post-Twilight <laughs> era. You are just really trying to get like the best out of like things with this. Uh, no, I, I love making fun of Twilight. It's the funnest. It, it was 156 episodes, and I didn't realize it, you could do 156 episodes in five seasons. Oh, of the Twilight Zone, not of Twilight. No, twi- oh, right. Of the okay. Twilight Zone. Yes. But it was... And it's, funny, it's funny, Mark, that you mentioned that because um, a people's attention spans these days are, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It gets to the point where I think it was Crypt TV that were putting out little webisodes that were little horror shorts that were only about maybe two, two and a half minutes long. And... Um, you know, if I were to make some sort of offhanded prediction about where that's going to go if anthologies continue, I think that they're going to get shorter and shorter, that you'll have a, a half-hour TV show with, you know, 10 episode, uh, ten short stories that are in it that are all about maybe five minutes long tops. But you know, it's Just funny. Like, yeah, go ahead. Like, like that. that's kind of the format of uh, a lot of cartoon shows. Oh, used to always be like that. Game. Yeah, or like even Looney Tunes. Right, if you go all the way back to the Looney Tunes, from you know, I mean, there were awesome Looney Tunes being produced in the '40s and '50s, and, um, and they're always like five, six, seven minutes long. So I would, you know, sit down as a kid and watch Looney Tunes for half an hour and get to see three or four stories. So, and that is because kids have short attention spans, obviously. <laughs> and now adults have and now, <laughs> attention spans. Yeah, now we've, we're, where we are is, uh, is is here, but. Like uh, someone say, it's like, a format though. It's a legitimate format, so you know. But it's kind of funny. You get a movie like The Avengers, and it was like, "Oh my god, this movie is so long." I'm like, "Really? Is it?" <laughs> I know everybody was making such a big deal. I'm like, I, I remember watching. Plan out your bathroom breaks. Make sure you don't drink anything four hours before the the movie. Yeah, I was like, I, I watched Bram Stoker's Dracula a million times, and I and like that's what like a good two and a half hours at least. Yeah, you know what I mean, so I'm the, the Coppola the Coppola joint. 
<laughs> well, like when Watchmen came out, that was almost three hours long. Yeah. I think it was like two hours and 45 minutes or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like all the Lord of the Rings movies are that long. And... Oh, God, the director's cuts of both those series. Like the director's cut of Watchmen is like three and a half hours long. And it's three and a half hours of gold. Like I love <laughs> all the stuff they added to it. But, um, oh, sure. But back to the uh, to, to your book, to Gorsh Reek, um, what made you, why did you guys decide uh, particularly uh, to do Gore Shriek, excuse me? Well, it's a combination of, of kind of where the company was going at the time, and then it was opportunity. So, uh, like I mentioned to you, uh, in my first round of doing uh, high IPs, if you will, uh, we were doing a lot of uh, adaption stuff, adaptions of movies mostly, uh, or continuations of movies, but existing IPs that were films. Uh, this time around, most of it was me wanting to do a lot of original creator-owned stuff, but we had opportunities early on to do things like The Dead Omnibus, which was an old, defunct comic book IP, and it kind of sparked something in us, and we were like, well, there's a lot of these comic books out there that not a lot of people know about, that just kind of, they fell under the radar, they came out at the wrong time. Uh, or their stuff that were fairly popular back in the day, but because of time, uh, you know, they've just kind of fallen off and kind of fallen into the ether somewhere. So when you think about all the different things that, that comic companies do when they go after products, whether it's uh, movie tie-ins or whatever, I don't think anybody is doing uh, old defunct comic books, uh, comic book IPs and especially horror stuff that's out there, which is all of our bag, uh, to have an opportunity to work with Ralph Griffith, as an example, Stuart Kerr, and do The Dead, which is a, literally a comic book that nobody knew about that was probably the most ultra-violent thing that we've ever done thus far, still, Gore Shriek included. Um, it was just one of those things that we felt people needed to see. And um, for most of the audience that we grew out of that, they were learning about the dead for the first time and they were loving it. I mean, if you go to um, eBay right now, I don't think you're even going to find a copy of it out there, which was the goal. We wanted to make books that people wanted to keep, not the books that people wanted to read once or twice and then try to sell for double and triple the price. <clears throat> um, Gore Shriek Resurrectus was another one of those things. You know, we kind of got high off the first book and we're like, well, what else is going on? And Mike, uh, again, our partner, uh, he had mentioned that he had been talking to Tom Schoolin, which was the creator of Gore Shriek, and that the 30th anniversary of the title was coming up in about a year, and maybe we should talk to him. So we had a, you know, we just had a, a standard formal business meeting, and out of that, we just, uh, you know, we were all part of the same bloodlines when it came to this stuff we all were on the same page with what we wanted to do and it was just very organic it just came so we're kind of like water we're just kind of going where it goes um every time i've done a product in the past it's always led to the next product whether it's you know uh like that halloween book that i mentioned to you uh i didn't go after that property the halloween people called me Nice. At three o'clock in the morning, because they didn't realize I was on the East Coast. They were calling from California. So, uh, don't ask me why I picked up the phone. That was back in the day when you did that. <laughs> when you can't send someone to <laughs> when you can't send someone to voicemail because you're like, I don't know who you are. Right, but you know, and especially back then too. Like now, we have social media and we have all these different ways to to get ourselves out there. But back in two thousand one, two thousand two, uh, we were pretty much a convention only entity you know you'd see us when a convention came around a horror convention we'd sell you our books then and then we'd pretty much go away we didn't even sell our books online so for for those folks to contact us specifically um that was a big deal you know that just let us know that we made a splash and that we actually put a dent into uh you know at the time especially a very oversaturated industry and the same thing is happening now uh, we want to do a lot of our own things, too, and we'll get to them. But right now, we're kind of riding the wave of uh, the opportunities that have been sent forth to us. But you know what's cool about doing a book like this, where it's an anthology book that existed in the past? <clears throat> you know, so so Derek and I, just uh, we just did Scaricon uh, about a month ago in Framingham, Mass. And that was really a uh, good time. It was a pretty successful con. And we uh, got to meet a lot of really, really cool people. And... Um, 
and a lot of people who came by uh, stopped and and they're like, oh, they do a double take on the on the table, and they're like, oh, oh my God, Gore Shriek, and they remember it. And then you know what their first question is: Is this the books? Are these the exact books that I remember just reprinted? That's what like a, a bunch of people said. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's really fun to be able to be like, you know what? These are a hundred percent all new material in here. It's just as if Gore Shriek was continued. Which like, is also, that's what we're doing. The, the series that you love, but the 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 content's all new. So we get to walk that. Absolutely. We get to walk that line of like, well, like Derek saying, you know, we, we want to do, you know, original stuff and don't want to just always be beholden to old titles or whatever. But for now, it's, it, you know, this is a really good book to be on because we get to do both. And I also think it's kind of cool that like you guys are, one of the things I, um, I detest is when someone takes the name of something and they completely change what it is. Oh, right? yeah, sure. So, but you guys are still keeping the essence of the, uh, of the book, which I think is phenomenal, which I'm pretty sure the fans who remember this also appreciate. Yeah, well, that... we were very much uh, on the same page with the fans because we are fans too. Uh, those are books that I collected when I was young. So uh, a lot of people sometimes, if they have the wherewithal, will will buy a title or buy an IP, uh, not knowing what it even is. They just know that they want to. Uh, to own it, you know, and they want to try to exploit it and make money off of it. Uh, and, and you see this in movies all the time, you know. Uh, uh, Joker! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> like Joker! <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time, you know, like you'll see a, a movie house lose the rights to a property and somebody else will scoop it up. And sometimes that's for the better, and a lot of times it's for the worst. Um, if it's not the original people that made it, it's really a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're going to get. Um, you know, the the Terminator series is a great example of that. If you look at some of the later sequels, that was that IP was passed around two or three times, and it's uh, it's back with Cameron now. But uh, look at the movies that came out of it, like Genesis and things like that. I mean, it's just um, sometimes these people just know that they want to make money off of it, but they don't know how to to preserve the essence of what made the, the IP special to fans in the first place. So first and foremost, with Rough House, we want to make sure that, that people understand that we're fans. We're fans of everything that we do. Uh, we don't just try to see what's popular out there and try to go after that. Um, if that was the case, then our first book out of the gate wouldn't have been a Bible-sized uh, comic book from the 80s that nobody ever heard about <laughs> ever, ever, you know that's just not how it would have went right um, but half the fun is you know you know as a fan what awesomeness lies between the pages of these books but the vast majority of the public out there have no idea so the fun of you bring that to the public and and hearing the feedback after they've had a chance to read it or how much they loved it uh, mark yourself as well. Uh, you had a chance to check it out, and you love the sink in Grover Cottonwood, and everybody else has a, a different favorite in there, and uh, that's what we do this for. We're trying to create uh, what I call tangible awesome, and uh, and yeah, with Gore Shriek, the idea is we wanted to keep it special. We didn't want to come out with a book every month kind of thing. We didn't want to go through Diamond. Uh, we do, we sell all our books <clears throat> online or at conventions, and um, and we we kind of market these books like they're movies. Like the book that you're holding in your hand is volume one, and we're marketing the second book that's about to come out, <coughs> in volume two, which we, we're calling the comic book sequel. Um, you know, so it's it's an event, and that's why we put all the specialness that we put into it, all the extras and everything else that make it uh, not just a not something that you could read on a tablet, uh, something you want to hold in your hand. It's something that you want to physically collect and have in your collection. Well, it's also kind of, um, I will say, one thing I will say about the book is it's like, you get into these stories and then it's like, and then it just ends. Like I was trying to remember what it was, the Dread Time story. Yes. It just, it like, it just stops and you're like, Oh, you've got to be kidding! Me. Like you know what I mean, <laughs> and like or the one like you know it comes from the sink. Like it was like it was like come on, you can't just end that. And then the werewolf one it was like I wanted more of Blind Agatha. It's Blind Agatha, right? 
Did I get the name? It's a uh, blind Aggie, but yeah, it's same oh. thing. Yeah, Aggie, so I'm Aggie, like, but... well, I wanted more of that. Like, I wanted now. I want a backstory and a great like one off. But <clears throat> did you need more Patsy? <laughs> there, there is no more Patsy. <laughs> We're gonna need a bigger Patsy to do a sequel to one of these one day. I I would love to see that because again, like some of these stories are, are like great. And then I got to the very last one, uh, uh, the uh, was it Tallmart, Fallmart? Uh, I forget what it was called. But um, when it was like all the stuff the, happened, the, um, zombie hardware store, the zombie hardware store, and I fell over laughing when the little girl grabbed those two dolls and I see what happened. I was like, oh, that is great. <laughs> Because uh, Steve was in the was in the kitchen grabbing um grabbing water or whatever, and all he could hear is my audible cackle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the 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 fun of Gore Shriek back in the day. A lot of the stories, if not all of the stories, are pretty contemporary for the most part. It's not really like gothic horror, like Tales from the Crypt. Um, it's more contemporary stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the stories that that um, Steve is working on for volume two is the first story i believe that takes place in the old west oh so, uh, and then of course and he'll talk about some of the stuff he's working on uh for future issues beyond that but they are a little bit more period which is cool um and again expanding that universe of gore shriek where you know we could have a story that is kind of like a wink wink nudge nudge like zombie hardware store which is completely freaking bonkers and over the top and just kind of you know Looney Tunes with zombies and monsters and craziness and gore and then we could have a story like Exordium where again we, we kind of make a joke of it the, the joke when we were putting that whole story together was uh, we, we called the story baby shower you know as a joke um, just to make ourselves <laughs> laugh but at the end of the day the story is very very deadly serious there's not any jokes to be had if you really look at it from a, a biblical standpoint if you will it's pretty much about the end of the world. It's about uh, a judgment happening to all of us. You know, all the children of the world are, are dying and not being able to be born, and that means that we're all going to die off. Um, so you can have those stories back to back. And if you notice, we did end the book on a Looney Tunes note and not a serious Oh, yeah, note. that's all, folks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to kind of bring people's spirits back up after that. But... The stories all have different timbres and tones, and um, when you put them all together, it kind of takes you on a not just a visual ride with all the different artists that that put their their stamp on the pieces, but uh, an emotional one too with the writing, which has been you know, most of the time with these with these stories, you get a lot of people that are like I just want the the blood and the gore, and that's fine with me. But to hear people come back and say, you know, this this story actually hit me in, in a certain way that actually means more because it's harder to do. I agree. And, I, and don't get me wrong. I'm a guy who loves his, his gore, his like wackiness and all the other stuff. But you don't get a lot of replay or reread value with that. Like, you know, but when you have a compelling story, people are going to be more likely to go back because it's like, oh, did I catch all of it? Did I, um, did I miss something? Like, you know what I mean? Was there a deeper meaning? Like the one with the, um, the baby shower. <laughs> like I didn't even think about like that aspect of it you know what I mean but that's 100% right and especially like you know that I'm thinking about it like the flash of light and like things like that like oh so yeah now it comes together so like something like that some people will take for face value because it's you know the imagery of it but realistically yeah. if someone actually goes back and makes the point to actually read what's going on yeah. they'll see that it's just more than just like the gore and the violence of things mm -hmm. And For sure. It's, and it's hard to do, you know, because really, you know, you're trying to create a compelling story. You're trying to have these moments of, uh, you know, because it's a, it's a quote, horror comic. It's a splatter punk comic, you know. Um, <clears throat> you got to have these moments and uh, these scenes and shock value, whatever. And, and you need, a com you know, compelling characters, too, if you can. You know, I think that that's also incredibly difficult to do in six or eight pages. You know, so sometimes... Or a lot of times, you know, one of those things has to sort of fall by the wayside. So it's like, well, character tends to be the one that you, you know, like in, in the sink, you don't, you don't know that much about anybody, and it doesn't really matter. A dread time story, it doesn't really matter. It's more that the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the situation that you've come up with is so uh, interesting, and and uh, you're left with this this shock, and it becomes about the shock and about the situation, about like, okay, it doesn't really matter who this little kid is. But if you can put yourself into their 
their PJs as they're laying in bed and then the monsters in the closet and then then you know okay that worked too you know yeah. but it's tough it's tough to do it all in such a short uh, length I mean a normal comics what 16 pa- pages anywhere between like 16 and 20 pages 16 20 pages so if you can make like a 16 or 20 page long story that's tough to fit all those things in yeah you know yeah but, as a matter of fact that that story uh, a dread time story which was uh, written and drawn by Bruce Balding Fuller is a great example of uh, going in telling your story hitting the beats and getting out mm-hmm. um, that would be the that would be the epitome of a crypt TV episode if you will mm-hmm. um, that's only a minute or two minutes long we go in there we hit you right between the eyes and we get you out of there and um, Bruce Balding Fuller uh, was one of the gets, and I guess this is a good way to segue into. Um, we mentioned that each comic book is is sold as a sequel to the last one, like a movie. So uh, if the star of the first issue uh, was Bruce Balding Fuller, which he was, Bruce Balding Fuller was the original artist uh, of Gorshreek, even though it was a rotating uh, band of artists that worked on that book, he was. The, the artist that was most known for the first volume. Gorshreek had two volumes. Uh, it went away for a little bit and then came back again. And the second volume uh, was uh, an artist called The Gurch. He goes by The Gurch. Um, and his style is absolutely amazing. Uh, Steve will, will, will sing his praises up and down and left and right. Um, <clears throat> what do you want? You want falsetto? You want some uh, death growls? What do you want? For sure. Death growls. And, um, and he was a big part of that second volume. So when we were doing the second volume of our book, we're like, well, who's going to be the star, quote unquote, of that? We're like, well, let's, let's see if we can get in touch with the Gurch. And we did. He's from the UK. He's from across the pond. And he only has an AOL account. So we <laughs> had a bitch of a time getting hold of him and finding him. But we did. And uh, gracious guy, very, very cool. When he found out what we were doing with Gorshree coming back, and he got the book that you have in your hands now, he was just invigorated. He loved what we did with it. He, you know, And when you have somebody who worked on it actually back in the day tell you that you hit the nail on the head, that's, that's when you know that you can sleep at night. That's when you know that you did a good job. Yeah, that's when feel, you can actually give yourself amazing. a little bit of a pat on the back. Um, and the Gurch just kind of threw up all over our stuff, man. He, he just gave us all sorts of new material and, and everything else, not just for this issue, but for future issues, too. So, um, and when I say throw up, I mean, he just kind of like artistically exploded all over this project. Um, and uh, I can't wait for people to see this new volume and what he's brought to the table and all of the oh, other amazing. artists that... Uh, um, <laughs> he said he threw up all over it. He said it like with excitement. And it was just like um, phrasing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a barf bag that that works for both. You know, people that enjoy the book and hate it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's let's start. I think that it'd be great to segue into issue two and the, some of the extras because um, the Gurch uh, is all over those extras. And uh, you mentioned the barf bag. Uh, so there are two covers. Do you, do you want to go there, Derek? Sure, not a problem. So uh, for this new volume, we're offering two front covers, two separate ones. Uh, Both are drawn by the Gurch. Uh, One cover, cover A, is actually limited to 250 copies. And it's going to include, on top of the book, both books are going to have a double-sided color poster in the middle. And they come with two stickers that are both the same on both uh, both, uh, covers. But specifically to cover A, we're giving fans a Gurch postcard. It's oh, an actual nice. postcard on the other side. You know, it has places for you to fill out your name and address and then write something to a friend. Um, and on the other side, it's uh, some amazing Gurch artwork, which is actually a faux advertisement for the... Uh, it's a mask advertisement that you'd see like in the back of a 1970s comic book uh, for the artwork that's on the front cover. So it's almost like offering you a mask version of that. Um, And it kind of alludes to that when you put the mask on, you just become a deviant person and you'll know when you see the artwork. You're you're going to get rough. Yeah. You're going to get, if you, if you weren't rough before, if you were like too smooth, maybe you're going to get, it's going to roughen you up if you wear that mask. You're going to get rough house. Yeah. 
<laughs> the mat the mask doesn't exist. Though. We do call it Roughhouse for a reason. Just, but it is it is an awesome uh like faux ad for that kind of thing. It's really cool. And that's for a sure. play on the stuff that, that was like the very first thing you read in the um in the book, right? When the uh, little girl puts the mask on and then like pulls it off and talks about this is really heaven, you're like Neh. Oh oh and the gateway to <laughs> gateway to horror. Yeah. Gateway to gore, yeah. Gateway to gore, right? Yeah, yeah they still look like no heaven to me. That um, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And um, we got the uh, in addition to that, specifically for this cover, uh, is a full length eleven song uh, horror metal band called the Maniac Banshees. And uh, to give you a little bit of a background on those guys, when we were still a Kickstarter or a crowdfunder uh, company. Uh, they, as a band, their brothers, uh, Dante and Marlon Mata, uh, they contributed an amazing amount of money to our campaign to make sure that Gore Shriek came back. Uh, they were influenced by Gore Shriek, uh, their music is, and they wanted to uh, make sure that, that we were brought back into public consciousness. And uh, the only thing they wanted in return, minus the perks that they were going to get, was that uh, we draw their front cover to their debut album. Nice. Yeah, so what we're getting, what fans are going to get, is the entire album. They get to have it on CD. Uh, I did the front cover for it. It's 11 songs. It's all original music. I'm calling it horror metal. I'm not sure if those guys have a, a kind of a, a, a way to, to let people know what their music is all about, but I'm telling you that this is professional quality shit it sounds so fucking good uh as a fan i just i love what they're doing the lead singer sounds like wayne Stanley. language uh, <laughs> the music is very industrial metal uh almost a little bit techno uh but more more industrial metal uh really really good stuff and it's a great extra for fans of the series you know they're gonna get one hell of an extra so uh, so that's limited to 250 copies for that. And then we have cover B, which is another cover from the Gurch. And that's going to come with a 12-page uh, ash can, which actually has two extra Gore Shriek stories in it. So, so um, for, do me a favor. For those people, because I, I had to Google um, ash can as well. Can you explain to people what an ash can is? Usually it's an advertisement uh, or something that a company does as an advertisement. It's like a, usually a very low-rent, pulpy uh, booklet, if you will. Sometimes it's not even saddle stitched, um, and it's just a way for people to like throw out advertising. It's almost like a newsletter in some aspects. Um, it's a low rent way for people to make copies of things and send them out there to other companies. Let them know that we're out there. Sometimes ash can is used. Uh, primer sometimes is used, um, but it's just kind of a way to to wet the whistles of fans and. and and media folks to let people know that something is coming out. But we've included it in this, so uh, that is, is digest sized, and it's going to be saddle stitched, and um, it's going to have two extra stories in it uh, by Alex Hoey and Jeff Zorno. Jeff Zorno is actually the artist who worked on Exordium, the, the uh, baby shower uh, story. And uh, so he gets to return to the series with a brand new story, um, and it's just a great little compendium to the book. So you get the entire 52-page book, which is up from 48. The, the book that you have is 48 pages cover to cover of artwork. This one is 52. Nice. And then people are going to get the ash can on top of that. And then in addition to that, they're getting a medical-grade barf bag, which is called the Vomit Buster. And uh, <laughs> they're getting oh, wait. that with the book. There's more. <laughs> And that, <laughs> but wait, there's more. In a barf bag, <laughs> they're getting the official medical grade vomit buster gore shriek barf bag with art yeah. by the Gurch. Wait, the, wait a second. You're telling me I get all of this and a medical grade barf bag? But wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, and that's actually 750 copies. So <clears throat> the cover A is the super limited edition. And that's going for fourteen ninety nine, and the other is uh, cover B, which is going for ten ninety nine, seven hundred and fifty copies, which is the, uh, the completion of the thousand book run that we have for each of these books. 
So it's it you know basically it's short dough. It's it's uh, really passionate creator owned stuff and uh, um, you know fully licensed I should say. Um, resurrected stuff from a lot of people's childhoods. I mean it was really cool seeing all those people stop at the table and know the title. That was really awesome. You know, it really is That's amazing to me how how many people do honestly like remember and and so you know I th I think if there's anything to take away from from what we try to do at Rough House, I think it's what you said, uh, Mark slash Wade. He called you Mark already. That's right. do, do people know your name's Mark? They, don't, they probably don't. They don't care. They don't listen. To that. No, <laughs> they don't give a shit on any conceivable level. But but you can't say damn it, Mark. That that doesn't work. The what? You can't say damn it, Mark. You got to say <laughs> damn it, Wade. Yeah, that's the difference. <laughs> but if there's anything you take away from uh, Rough House Publishing, it's what you said. Uh, about the you know it's it's like the heart being in the right place uh, you know we're not we're not taking this title and just doing whatever the hell because we don't know anything about it and you know stomping all over what the thing was we very carefully uh, crafted something that was exactly uh, what the original spirit of the book was and it is a uh, it is you know perfect for people who loved it back in the day and can pick this up and just continue. Um, because the last issue of Gore Shriek before us ran, I believe it was like 91, right? 93, maybe? Uh, no, 91 or 92 was the last issue. So uh, 1986 was the first, 1991 or two was the last. And it only had 13 issues in its entire run. And now it has uh, it has one more. It's going to have uh, one more after that uh, in a couple weeks and uh, about four more before uh, we're done anyway. Uh, yeah. And again, we wanted to keep it special, so we, we're not trying to continue the license for another 10 years and just keep on doing this. We want these individual volumes to be something that if you were there and you were in the right place, you got them and you're keeping them and you're holding on to them. Otherwise, they are gone forever. And they are going really fast, too, which has been great. The, um, the public response to what we've been doing has been phenomenal so far. Uh, one thing I want to ask, and this is something um, I'm really big on, on the, the show is the gift and the curse of doing things on your own like you know what I mean like like you're you guys are creators so it was always really, if you could all talk about like you know the uh, like Rough House Publishing is your thing and you talk about how working with other people kind of left the bad not other people but like big companies kind of left the bad taste in your mouth but can you tell people like the, the sure and I'm actually going to use this as an opportunity to tell you how I met Steve too yeah um, this would be good because that ties directly into uh, what you're asking me but um, just in general like bigger companies uh, well let's 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 talk about like say Marvel and DC you know uh, Marvel's owned by Disney DC is owned by Time Warner uh, back when I started collecting comics they were both independent companies and you uh, you had a lot of trendsetters and risk takers and some really compelling artwork um, done by very classically trained artists and some amazing writing that came with that as well. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen now, but uh, with all, say, like, for instance, these Marvel movies that you see, and uh, I'm a huge fan, a lot of us are huge fans of them, and they're great, and they're, they're fun, but when you think of all of their caloric intake, uh, how many movies of those movies have a lot of replay value you know they're event movies you're there opening weekend you're opening night you go see them two three four times in the theater you might catch them one or two more times on you know uh, whatever service that you have later on um, but I don't think that th those are movies that you're gonna watch uh, you know 20 times 30 times 40 times in your life especially since there's you know the entire story encompasses almost 20 something movies um, and the comic books don't, the, there wasn't an increase per se in comic book sales because comic book movies became much larger and more um, accessible to the public, uh, or more, I should say, uh, digestible to the public. Uh, comic books for Marvel, to me, if you're asking me personally, uh, are more advertisements for much much more profitable and bigger IPs they don't make a lot of money in comics so they don't put a lot of time and effort into comics so the question becomes often what came Just first the chicken or the egg you know it, are we not making money on comics because the comics are bad or is it the other way around you know is it that we're uh, we're not putting enough time and effort into them and that's why no one's coming 
So um, I think that they hire people uh, at lower rates than they deserve. Uh, I think I'm not talking about specifically just Marvel and DC, but we're talking about bigger companies in general. Um, I think they they buy low and sell high, really, to be honest with you. And for it to be an artist driven business, and uh, I, I know people that have bought comics that buy them. If we talk about the image era back in the early '90s, people were buying those books for the artists. They didn't even care if the writing was any good. That's true. And uh, and it was that was where that whole boom came from. And a lot of books were like that. You had some amazing art, and mm, sometimes the stories were okay. Sometimes they weren't. The, a good artist doesn't necessarily equate to a good writer. Um, but as, uh, unless you're talking about myself, unless you're talking about Roughhouse Publishing, I mean, you know. Well, duh. Well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Roughhouse is what I've referred to in in many interviews is a shelter, if you will, for artists and creative people that have been screwed over by the system. And it's stemming from me because I was screwed over by the system. I've had people that. Uh, you know, and you'll hear this from every artist that there is. You know, people want to pay you in everything but money. <laughs> you know, they'll they'll give you a piece of their grandma's apple pie before they give you a dollar. And most people don't have a lot of money to begin with. To be fair, and my favorite uh, is um, I've heard this over and over again when someone will go, "Oh, we'll pay you with experience." Oh, I mean, it, it's the one thing that we hear more than anything else is that, you know, the exposure and everything else. Uh, I'm so friggin' exposed, you can see my heart from the outside. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I need to be exposed like I need a bag in my hip. <laughs> Get this man some, <laughs> some skin. My but, goodness. Um, but, yes, yeah, so at a certain point, I, uh, I just said, screw it. And, and I wanted to just be away from all of that and not even have to deal with it and um and this has been a roller coaster ride for us i mentioned that we started off as a crowdfunded company and then uh we made a transition not too long ago and by the time and when i say we i mean pretty much me at that point because there had been some uh things that have changed a lot of uh folks that were working with us earlier had either moved on or whatever it didn't work out um I mentioned to you that I started with uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was promotion and sales, and uh, we're no longer together. So I really kind of was at a crossroads where I wanted to take the company to another level, but I just knew that I couldn't do it all by myself. As it is, even with all this help, there's still a lot of hats to be worn. Um, you talk about the, um, the trials and tribulations of being a small company, and we'll get into that more in detail. but. I just knew that I couldn't do it all myself, so secretly uh, I was kind of seeking out another partner, somebody that I could be close with, that I could work tightly with, and um, and put out some quality content, but it couldn't just be anybody. I didn't make any advertisements for it, I didn't say, hey, you know, Rough House is looking for this, this, and this. Um, and Steve mentioned Scaricon that we did together this year, but last year is actually where we met at Scaricon. And, uh, he came over and introduced himself, said hello and everything else, and uh, he's an amazing writer. He had his own books. Um, he had a great personality. He loves Alice Cooper. Um, so, you know, actually, he could have sucked with everything and just been a fan of Alice Cooper. And uh, you you forgot that. to mention the handsomeness. <laughs> and the, the, the boyish good looks. Yes. That, uh, you know, That's right. Thank you. No, I appreciate you, you throwing that in there. Sure, sure. <clears throat> he's like a bald Dick Grayson. <laughs> don't don't ever serious. say that again. Like, two dudes become friends. What did you say? <laughs> I'm not allowed to say it again. <laughs> You'll have to listen to the episode. I'm not repeating it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he he was just a good dude, you know. Like he was friends with a lot of people that we've worked with in the industry already. Uh, so there was a lot of cross pollination there. A lot of people said good things about him, and then um, I was like, you know what? This could work. We we've, we've got a lot of the same um, attributes. We want a lot of the same things, and um, and that's where it stemmed from. So when the book you're holding in your hand was actually uh, the 
first issue of the ongoing series, which means the first issue that wasn't crowdfunded. Um, we built a website, an e-commerce store, and we went for it. That book came out in January, and here we are in July. Yeah. I was just, I was like, dead air. I wasn't sure if you were done yet. <laughs> but no, it's cool, but I also, and, and, it's, and Steve's awesome. Like, he's been a uh, super supportive of the stuff I do, and like, you know what I mean? He helps any way he can, and like, and I do the best, and I do the same. Like, when I found out he was in a metal band, I'm like, yo, please send me over the single. <laughs> so like you know I do the best like like he's it's a testament to being who he is and when he knew this was coming out he was like oh hey do you mind if we um and you just kind of like yeah absolutely like you know what I mean so and I'm glad it did because like I said I'm a fan and I'm going to pre-order the next book because this is this is freaking great and I'm going to tell anybody who will listen like yo you need to check this out awesome man we appreciate it very very much yeah very cool I mean like you know Wade is such a big comics fan I mean you know I can't, I, I mean, I read a lot of comics back in the day, m mostly Marvel, but most of my stuff was like 80s, 90s, and this guy, I just, I just, it's so hard for me to keep up with this guy, because, you know, he's reading everything, he's read all that, and he, he never stopped, so, you know. Yeah, and all the stuff that I was That's why I wanted to come on, too, not only because, you know, we're friends, but, like, you are such a, a comic fan and a comic booster, and you know, you know what's good. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I can appreciate that, too, because it's funny. Like, I write articles, um, and then, like, it's funny watching the people who just get so angry. And I'm like, well, if you actually read, I actually made every point that you just made. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just need to be, you know, we're, we're in this era of, of toxic fandom. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't yeah, understand it. Definitely. Somebody put out a quote that said, um, I'm probably going to say it wrong, but uh, it was something along the lines of the... The people who hate the, these genre movies the most are the people that love them the most, or the fans. You know what I mean? Like, we tear apart our own shit. We just can't sit down and watch a good... Whether it's a good or bad movie, we can't just sit down and watch it and not try to destroy it at the same time. It's it's really been sickening how... how uh, like, for instance, when the, the Last Jedi came out, how fans were going after... Um, story plot points and, and just being super toxic. I forget the name of the actress, but someone went uh, completely over the top about her ethnicity and just whatever. Just, everybody's got a microphone and nobody's got nothing to say, you know? So they oh just God, spew out bullshit. That's exactly what it is. Um, and to self-promote myself again, I wrote an article called Toxic Fans Are Ruining the Things We Love. And so I, I reached out to a few comic book writers to share some of the stuff that's been said, and I won't say some of them because they're little ears, but one of them, this was probably the best one that I can share. I'll never share the worst of it because I don't want to give the people who send it the satisfaction of the tiniest moment of attention or their recognition. Their words, their words will never be repeated. It's so bad that he won't even say what was said. Mm. Yeah. And it was over, like, the dumbest thing. It was like, it was like uh, I think it was like Superior Spider-Man when he was Doc Ock for a while. And it was funny because people were crapping on it so much that I was like, oh, now I need to read this. And it ended up being great. And, was like, <laughs> and even when I find things and I read um, comic books that I don't like, I will tweet that I don't like it, but I don't make it a point to find the writer, find the artist, find the publishing company, and then spend like 10 minutes of my <laughs> Man life. hours. Yeah, of like just going, oh, this is just absolutely garbage. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. It's like, I don't even, like, I don't care enough to do that, man. It's like, and I, and if someone, it's like, it's again, like, and I, people have come at me and said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll see you next week when you read the next article I write. <laughs> like, I, like, you know what I mean? And I, and, it's, and I think because of, I've had, because I've had these experiences, like, you know, forever, I think I have, I understand. Maybe it's just years of customer service and knowing that I shouldn't be saying the things to people that people have been saying to me. Well, right. we, we have an obligation as creators, yourself included, that <clears throat> you know we're not going to follow in the same footsteps as some of this toxic behavior that's around us. So, you know, they have to read your article every week in order to hate it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, and, exactly. I, and I notice people who hate your stuff will share it more than they do if they love it. Seriously, it's a joke. Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches in a way, but uh, it sure is. It's funny. Yeah, well, I don't know, man. You, you, it's it's a gift and a curse, man. But 
in a, in a, in a sad way, I do kind of like the negative negativity. This one person wrote a three paragraph long uh, comment on something that I wrote. And then ended it with "Go F yourself." Longer than what you wrote. Yeah, I think it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> and then ended it with like "Go F yourself," and I was like, "Well," wow. <laughs> and I, I just simply wrote with a smiley face. I think I will. Thanks, sunshine. <laughs> oh no! Even better. I just went thanks for reading, and then smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, must have driven him mad. And every year I tell myself when it comes up again on the, little, the Facebook memory thing, I keep telling myself I'm going to print it out and I'm going to frame it. Yeah. Because it was that good. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, everybody gets, anybody who's creating anything and is subject to reviews, it's like, that's sort of what you have to do with all the negative reviews. Um, you know, if you're a writer, if you're a musician, if you're, uh, you know... A, a chef, a chef, you know, I mean, it's I mean, like, hell, if you're you, a, a you, farmer making tomatoes, right? I mean, people are gonna, people are gonna have bad opinions. And, and like, you know, I've, I've known people who there's sort of like this, this, uh, thing with, with authors that I've, that I've found where like when people get their first one star review, that's what they do. They frame it. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, I finally got my one star review. Here's what it said. They clearly read the first paragraph of the book and then judged the whole thing. Yippee! And it's going on the wall. And that's what you do. So oh, I can't wait to get my first one star review. <laughs> I, I honestly can't because it, again, I might do the exact same thing. I might frame it. I might. I'm gonna do the hang loose sign in front of it. <laughs> I might. You know, I might do a whole montage where I take it out to dinner. <laughs> Like me and, and like make a whole photo album. Me and my one star review. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely you have to do this. You know, I may just write you a one star review on something so I oh, can see Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's fun. We should all write our own our, our one star reviews for each other. You yes. know, and that'll be like a secret. I love you. Derek, we are. And the more toxic and the more vapid it is, uh, the more we're actually saying, attaboy, keep doing the good work. Attaboy. And it's funny, but someone reading it going, wow, they really hate this person. <laughs> <laughs> All the other reviews are great. What the hell is this guy's problem? <laughs> One star. I didn't like the word the in paragraph <laughs> two of section three. Ned, there were too many thes. <laughs> How many thes do you need in a paragraph? Honestly, there were 72. <laughs> I mean, how many babies have to fall from the sky, actually? I wonder if I can get away with uh, calling this episode "How many babies must fall from the sky." I don't. I don't know about that. <laughs> the answer to that is apparently all the fucking babies. Every fucking. Baby. I, I'm not calling it all the fucking babies. <laughs> I'm not calling it that. <laughs> There was a there was a moment where, where Derek said something in this episode. Now I can't remember what it was, and I thought for sure you were writing it down for the episode title. Uh, uh, uh I, I might have actually. <laughs> the sequel is going to be called uh, "Falling of the Baby Mamas." Oh, the, oh mom, the, the mamas turns. And then the prequel, the prequel will be "Falling of the Baby Daddies," and then you know, then pretty much everybody will have an equal plot in one of our books. Well, well, there's that secret darkness about. Um, about uh, the Avengers Endgame because everybody who came back after you know Stark restored everybody right and they, they in the new Spider-Man they, they refer to that as the blip yeah. everybody who was blipped and then they came back it's like well what if they were flying in a plane now there's no plane because they're supposed to like you know reappear wherever they were <laughs> where, yeah. when, when they got snapped away so it's like uh, there's a lot of planes in the sky so <laughs> um, that's definitely what happened Hold up, they're, just, they're just not talking about it but that's definitely what happened you ready for this I can explain it you ready okay when the Hulk snapped his fingers uh -huh. not only did he blip the people back he said he thought to himself blip them back safely uh huh see well, Boom. It, well it was Professor Hulk Professor Hulk so it, if it was if it was dumb Hulk, you wouldn't have thought to do that. <laughs> no. Oh gosh. We can't talk about Professor Hulk. Derek Derek's sensitive. He. I like Professor Hulk. He he's a he's a big Hulk fan and. Well, well, Wade Wade calls himself Hulk most of the time. Too. Yeah, that's that's what I'm angry. And I don't know if you, so if you're a Hulk fan and um it's it, the episode's running a little bit long, but who cares? Are you reading Immortal Hulk? 
I am, as a matter of fact. I haven't. I've gotten to issue 11, and I'm not a fan of the Hulk solo. I love him and other stuff, but I'm a bigger fan of Bruce Banner. And I think that's my... I have no idea who this is. Uh, let's just answer it and add them to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I no, I would not like to change my electricity. Oh, that was Super Warp Robbie. Oh, shit. That was Super Warp Robbie. <laughs> but yes, uh, Immortal Hulk has been one of uh, the gems that... Because I stopped reading comics almost altogether. Like, I, t- title by title, I started just winding down um, and reading a lot more <laughs> indie stuff. Uh, amazingly... Image right now is probably the industry leader for some of the best independent, true independent stuff. Um, and then the rest of it, the the best independent stuff, you're actually getting on crowdfunding sites and things like that. Um, but I digress. Uh, Mortal Hulk, you should uh, definitely continue with if you if you've been in like if you've been enjoying it so far. I'm loving it. I just it's just one of those things where because I write so much now, it's like I find myself doing more research. Than anything, and then I be, I just got into DC Comics this year. Hold on. Hey, hey Super Walk. Yo. Um. You but, posted on episode, bro. I did. <laughs> yeah, it's the most. You posted on the Steven Chef. Me and who? Steven <laughs> Chef. I did. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm listening to it right now. Oh, spook. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm gonna have to edit this. I'm actually recording right now, so I'm gonna hang up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi everybody. What are you recording? <laughs> you have to listen to the episode. <laughs> What's up, Javi? It's 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 Steven and Samson, man. What's up? Oh, what's going on? Um. Yeah. Hi, old man. Wait, Um. Nothing wrong. No technical difficulties. And I'm out. Peace. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete this right. I'm gonna delete this episode right now. Thank you for the heads up, man. Yeah, no problem. All right, later, man. Yeah. Only a, oh shit, did I just hang up on him by accident? God, oh, spook. Oh sure. So roughhousepublishing.com for definite. That's our home website. That's got uh, all the information on everything we do. Everybody that's involved. All the books that we have. All the all the different things that we have for sale. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, we're on Twitter at RHP Comics, at RHP Comics. And uh, I've been told that if I don't have an Instagram up in the next couple weeks, I'm going to get lynched. So I'm probably going to have uh, a Instagram up as well soon for folks uh, to enjoy. And uh, we're pretty easy to find. You put us in a, any search engine and we pop right up. It's funny because I actually specifically went looking for um, you on Instagram while we were on it. I was like, I don't see him anywhere. <laughs> you know, like, everybody says that Instagram is, like, the anti-Facebook now. Um, whereas, like, Facebook has become, again, that just really negative, toxic, you know, place to, to hang out and air dirty laundry and whatever. You see, Instagram is kind of happy. It's all pictures and just, you know, for the most part, it's none of that. I don't... Can, I don't think you can even write stuff down over there, right? It's pretty much just you photos. can, but you can. But I, I've even noticed that, like, I I don't get a lot of um, uh, shenanigans or anything like that on my Instagram. Um, so I kind of just I spend a lot of time just like scrolling through that and posting like those stupid comic book stuff. But especially with um, what you guys are doing, um, this is this is gonna be like perfect for um, Instagram. Because it's not because the artwork is so good and it's also so um, detailed that people are gonna even when they're scrolling they're gonna stop and go uh, what was that you know what I mean yeah so it's actually that's amazing cool. it's like it's a great place to do it I'm so glad you liked the book man that's cool oh yeah I absolutely did and trust me if I didn't I would I would have found a way to talk about everything else but not liking it <laughs> 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 because I'm a polite host but no like I um he makes ribs. I make ribs. I make great um, make chicken wings. Great chicken wings. Not Dude, you had me at chicken wings and ribs. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. You can eat the book now. <laughs> <laughs> Just invite me over to some ribs and we're good. But I want to mention too, everybody, so if you are interested in us, please go to the website and uh, and pre-buy the next issue. 
um, that would be huge. It's it's short dough. You have the two versions, or you know, check them out, see what one works for you, or just pick them both up because you know that's fun too, and you get the whole collection. And uh, we are also going to be uh, appearing, uh, Mr. Derek Rook and I, at Rock and Shock, uh, which is this October 11th, 12th, and 13th. That's at the mm-hmm. DCU Center in Worcester at the Palladium, as it where it usually is. So and. Uh, I gotta say, I don't know if uh, you guys have seen the guest list this year, but it's, it's going, it's it's growing pretty well. We got we got a lot of Evil Dead and a lot of Twin Peaks. It's um it's coming around. You know, they had a, a couple tough years, and I'm sure that if they had any way to av- avoid having gone through that slump, they would have. But they're definitely back on the upswing, and uh, I think it's going to be an amazing year. Here we so, go. I'm really looking forward to it. Bruce Campbell, Cheryl and Finn, Ray Wise is going to be there, Cheryl Lee. Um, and for bands, uh, friggin' Napalm Death is going to be there. That's a damn good I name. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Uh, Napalm Death and Municipal Waste are the two headliners at this point. That's great. So that's pretty insane. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, that. if you guys haven't been, it's a really fun con. It's... Uh, it's a little bit unique in the world of conventions, I think. It's it's pretty fun. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested, definitely check us out there. But find us on, on the web. Uh, it's uh, Steve Ann Sampson, Derek Rook. We're both on all the stuff except Instagram, as you heard. <laughs> We're too old, but maybe someday. Who knows? I don't know if I'll be there. Um, maybe it'll just be a roughhouse account. I, I don't know if you'll find Steve Ann Sampson there. Well, tell them where they can find your book. Uh Okay, so real quick, uh, my two books are The Bone Eater King and Marrow Dust, and I've been on uh, the show a couple of times. We were talking about uh, each one, one at a time. So just briefly, they're uh, post-apocalyptic vampire pulpy adventures, um, and they take place in Africa. So it's uh, we were talking about Twilight. I love I love making fun of Twilight. These 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 vampires do not sparkle. They are they're not dateable. <laughs> you don't go date these vampires. They uh, they eat you. And you run from them, and that's what you do. Um, but so if you know you want a different take on uh, that kind of a thing, you're sick of vampires, maybe. Um, Who you think sick of vampires? I don't know. I'm just saying if you know. I don't know. I don't know. People, people are sick of stuff. I don't know. They're but if, vampire, if you love it, check it out. If you if you may be sick of vampires, hey, you know this is a this is a flavor you haven't had before, and uh, they are available right now on Amazon, and I believe we are uh, cleared. Through a conversation we had off off mic, Derek and I had that we're, we're uh, I'm going to drop a little bit of a little bit of a teaser here in saying oh, yeah. that these books are going to be welcomed into the Rough House catalog in 2020. And oh, yeah. I don't I don't want to get into too many details, but we got some really cool stuff planned, and they will be re released uh, bigger and better than ever. Um, but if you want the originals, they are on Amazon. It's up to you. Um, once once we make the, the switch, the original in its form won't exist anymore. So um, there you have it. Um, get the originals, buy the new ones too. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what I would do. That's what I. I mean, that's my advice. But hey, but I am everything with the Rough House logo on it, and uh, and, <clears throat> and everything that Steve has done that doesn't have one on it yet. And I also. <laughs> was that Megatron? Yes. Nice. Excellent. 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 I also have a book uh, coming out in a few weeks, actually, uh, maybe th- uh, three weeks or so. The um, New England horror writers, who are my buddies, uh, that's actually who I was with when I when I met uh, Derek uh, at the la- the what is it? Eighteens uh, Scaricon, and yes. uh, the the they're putting out a book in a, in about three weeks or or a month. Um, and it's called it's called Wicked Weird, and they do an anthology. Back to the anthologies, actually, uh, every year, pretty much, they do a, a, an anthology, and it always has the word "wicked" in the title. So there's like "wicked witches" and "wicked haunted," and but this is "wicked weird." It's "wicked weird." I guess that's how you're supposed to say it. it's "wicked weird." Wicked weird. Wicked weird. Weird. And uh, so I have a I have a uh, story in that, and it's funny because uh, as Derek said, uh, my story that's in Gore Shriek number two is actually a weird western. Uh, the, the story that's in uh, Wicked Weird is also a weird western. So a Wicked Weird western. It's a Wicked Weird western, yeah. Because I, I actually like that kind of crap. So hey, well, I'm, I'm I'm just bringing it. I'm just bringing it. I'm putting my thing down. That's all I'm doing. I don't know. I don't know. I, I enjoy everything you write, so I'm good, man. 
Thank you, man. <laughs> All right, this has been the Old Man Wade Show. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Brookmaster General. Uh, thank you, sir. Steve Van Sansen. Thank you. Uh, Maddie in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> we got Dr. Maddie oh, in the corner. God. Say hi. Oh, my God. I forgot that Maddie was there. That's okay. All right, just Did, yeah. she, did she, she hear all of yeah. this? No, we made her sit in the corner with earmuffs on, douche. Yikes. Damn it, Wade.